committees, of course, are just one part, an essential part of the governance cycle. But I use a frame of what I call a phoenix cycle with committees, which if your organization is on a strategy cycle of strategy renewal or even confirmation every, let's say, three years, every time you renew your strategy, every committee should be sunset and reborn. Because no committee should exist without an operational strategic priority that drives its purpose and its existence. And so there's committees that will come back, but the top line part of the charge of any committee should be what is the strategic or operational driver that demands the need for this body. is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Lowell Applebaum, CEO of Vistacova. Hey, Lowell, welcome to the show. Hi, Joanna. It's so nice to be with you today. Hey, Lowell, this is my 50th episode. Whoa. I know. That explains all the uh, decorations in the background and why you sent me cake and why we're, I guess, toasting with champagne at the end. (laughs) I thought that for my 50th episode, it was really important to have you on because I have so many chief execs who talk about governance and how it powers their organizations. And governance and Lowell Applebaum are pretty much synonymous in the association community and on LinkedIn. So let's start with you telling us about Vistacova. Vistacova is a company of facilitators that love to partner primarily with nonprofit organizations and professional associations, trying to help them have better conversations Everything from strategic planning and visioning to, as we're talking about today, governance, how to structure governance, how to help your boards be better at what they do, sort of the backbones of how you build the future of your organization or the conversations we like to help organizations have. So Lowell, I interview and work with many chief execs who are very, very talented and do a phenomenal job of managing their boards and establishing those relationships. Why bring in an outside person? You know, the, the managing the board, that relationship focus is essential for the success of any chief executive. It's often when it comes to the board learning how they could function better. When it comes to the board being reflective over how the structure they have may not be the structure they need, any of those places where there's even the hint or suggestion of what the current state is may not be what the current, the future state needs to be. I find it's always helpful for an organization to bring in a nonpartisan third party that can ask honest questions so that leadership can not feel attacked or, oh, you have some bias in this, but can be reflective. And, you know, when you're asked a question of, as you think about the vision for your organization and the leadership structures needed to support getting to that vision, is the leadership structure that you have today really the one that the organization needs You don't want that to feel like an attack. You want that to feel like part of the fulfillment of duty of being an officer of the organization. And if it's the CEO or an internal staff person asking that, there could be some concern of bias there, right? There could be some concern of it being more of a attack nature because there's a personal relationship with it. And so I find organizations are wise to bring in a third party when they're going to have those sometimes hard, but often meaningful and always shifting conversations around leadership structure. And nine times out of 10, you have a better conversation because of it. 
and hopefully are able to start a new chapter that the organization needs on what its governance looks like. Lowell, that's an interesting insight. Last December, I wanted to have a discussion with my staff about where they were. What were they thinking about as we were climbing out of the pandemic? And I worried that if I led that discussion, that I then couldn't be part of the discussion or that people would feel a little bit reluctant to be very honest. Is that part of why you bring in an outside person as well? Because I did, and I felt like he brought a ton to the table. You know, I'd say there's two or three pieces that you nicely identified the start of them, Joanna. The first is that a true facilitator is somebody whose voice is the least important in the room. They're asking the critical questions. They're setting the architecture so that hopefully people can hear perspectives that they wouldn't normally hear with a more openness, right, with more consideration. That means that inherently the facilitator that you bring can't also be a contributor. Ah. Otherwise, their perspective can bias the conversation. It could bias the sharing. There could be some concern that they are trying to steer it in a direction where they want it to go. And so whenever an organization, especially as I do strategic framing work, whenever they do that internally, usually the person they have leading it internally is a voice they want at the table contributing. Having that voice they're contributing as well as facilitating, it's too many hats to wear at once to do any one of them well. So Lowell, before we get into a deeper discussion about governance and why it's on every chief executive's mind, Let's talk about your journey. So how did you get to found Vistacova? You know, I often am in conversation with colleagues about how they find the association world, and nine times out of ten, they say they fell into it. Yes. So I'll say the founding of Vistacova was a happy coincidence of incidents, if you will. I worked inside associations for a better part of 12 years, everything from membership and professional development to global business development, and I was a COO. My background, I have a master's in informal education with a focus in leadership. I just finished my coursework for my doctorate and working on a capstone project for that now. But when I reached sort of this apex point of eventually coming out of being a COO, two paths diverged in the wood. One path, if you would, led to being a CEO, and there was exploration of that. And the other path led to what I recognized was a skill set that had always been part of my journey which was my love of working with people, my passion and strength for listening deeply and openly, and really trying to be a brilliant mirror, right? To reflect back what someone's saying that they often can't hear themselves. And that led to facilitation. And over the course of this year of exploration, what became clear was that there was a lot of opportunity to work not just with one organization, but with many organizations that needed to hear themselves better if they were going to have a more focused vision and a stronger leadership structure. And coming up on seven years later, here we are. It's a little bit different than when I started. Vistacova has 13 staff now. We worked with over 120 organizations last year. It's not what year one looked like. But I'm proud of what we do because we are looking to take the amazing work that nonprofits and associations do to build a better community and better world. And hopefully we're an exponential amplifier of that potential. Well, I'll tell you, Lowell, your name comes up a lot when an association is thinking about governance, when they're thinking about having a strategic discussion with their board, or they think they want to have a change. So let's turn to governance. How do you define governance? I think that it was initially well-established well in the will to govern well. And there's some, I'd say, conflation of governance, right? Because inherently, if something has the word committee attached to it, the thought is it must be governance. The will to govern well looks at governance as the decision-making bodies of the organization, how the people in those positions get to those positions and the power that they have. And so from that frame and that focus, governance are the bodies of the organization that determine direction and help allocate the right resources in the right way to get to that direction. So that would mean something like a nominating committee that helps select leaders, an essential part of governance. A special interest group that's around a singular topic, incredibly important for a committee of the organization as a component of the organization but not necessarily part of governance. 
And it's important that each piece has their purpose, right? You have programmatic bodies, you have community bodies, special interest groups, and then you have governance bodies. And there's areas of overlap. You know, one of the smartest things you can structure in a governance body is to leverage your community bodies as places of input and perspective. So if you have a next generation young professional group of some kind, tapping into them, not just as a community that gets together, but for perspective and how do we focus value and benefit of the organization that speaks to you should absolutely then influence the decision that governance makes. Ah. So there's lines of connection. But governance, if you will, is the one who hopefully sets the direction, is able to speak to the direction and purpose, and then ensures that resources, whether they're fiscal, staff, volunteer, are structured and allocated correctly so that progress towards mission is made. Lowell, almost every guest that I have on this podcast talks about governance and talks about board relations. And they all say that when they have a good relationship with their board, the organization thrives. When they don't have a good relationship with the board, or somehow the board is unclear on what its role is, then the organization suffers. So what are some things chief execs need to think about to really establish that great relationship with the board so that they can work together? I mean, I have Russ Webb of the Bay Area Apartment Association who says, I need the board to tell me the direction and the goals, and then I'll get them there but they shouldn't be involved in all the details. Yeah. He's a brilliant mind I always listen to, so I, I do enjoy listening to him. Absolutely. You know, the premise within your question has sort of two or three lenses to it, Joanna. The first thing you mentioned was the relationship between the CEO and the board. And I think there's two or three efforts there that need to be intentional. When there is a review that we're doing of governance, and part of that is what is the pathway that someone walks through the nomination process to get on the board, mm. one of the smart steps of that is that everyone who is a potential candidate to serve on the board should have time with the CEO, a half hour interview, something where they're able to have an initial dialogue. It's not for the CEO to judge them or to say who they like or not. That's dangerous. Do not do that. But it's for every candidate to have, even before they know they're on the board, a feel for the CEO's purpose, how they see the role of the board, the direction of the organization. So it lays a foundation for a relationship. The second piece of it is that often CEOs will specifically pay attention to the officers or executive committee because they spend the most time with there. But smart CEOs will create a pattern or a place by which they monitor the relationships with all the board members. I liken that to having a dry erase calendar that you have on your wall. Instead of every month in those boxes, you have like a different board member. And so you have like a little bit of information. What's their dog's name, right? Like, what are their kids doing? So you can quickly recall it. But then every month, the CEO says, okay, as I think about the past month, how would I rate the relationship I have with this board member on a scale of one to 10, right? And it's clear the ones that are eight, nine, or 10, you know, because those are the ones you love to spend time with. Yes. The ones that are one or two, you also know. And however you deal with those, you know those exist. But the truth is, the ones you forget about are the three to six range, where things are fine. No news is good news, but that's not always the case. And so CEOs that recognize the value of a relationship with the board will then proactively reach out to the, the ones that are in that three, four, five, six, and say, hey, can we have a cup of coffee and just check in, right? Just to reinvest in the relationship, to proactively say, I care about this relationship. Whether or not they get to eight, nine, or 10, it bumps it up a few. The third thing you said that's the dependency on this is the clarity of expectation of the role and responsibility of the board member before they come onto the board. Uh -huh. There's very practical roles, responsibilities. How many board meetings are you expected to attend? You are expected to read the materials before the board meeting. Those kind of practical, tactical, that should be clearly stated. And there should be some accountability. If not, and by the way, if you earn your CAE, you learn staff to staff and volunteer to volunteer. Accountability, hopefully, of board members should be through the president or chair or the officers. But with that said, in terms of setting expectations, more and more, if we want to see successful board members, it's because why we needed that specific board member. 
What is the skill set they bring? What is the interest they bring that outside of the general responsibilities of the board as a whole that you are looking to hopefully strengthen, leverage in some way, make sure there's an intersect between their area of passion, interest, or skill, the need of the organization, and how you structure their work. That's the secret sauce to building a stronger relationship because then they're not a cog in a wheel. Then they're an individual that's giving specific service to the organization. That's interesting. So you're saying let's be intentional about the type of board members that we have so that they bring a diversity of perspectives and experiences and have something different to contribute. So this makes me think of Rick Grimm from NIGP, who has non-members on his board, and they are brought in to be experts. But every other client of mine has members on the board. What do you think of that? Where, like, I have an advisory board, and there are people from different industries because I find that their perspective is so valuable. I don't need them necessarily to be in the association space. So I'd say two or three things. I think if you look at most certification bodies in their boards, they will often have a public member, and there is reason for that. So you get that external perspective or external strength that you want to. I think if you're going to differentiate the composition of your board to not only have members, I think it needs to be with the intent of what you're trying to accomplish by doing so. You should not have a huge board, and you're never going to have every audience represented on the board. Correct. No matter how big you make it. Right, right. No matter how hard you try. Right. And so it's really not about quantity. It's about alignment of the quality and depth of the skills, experience, and personality of the individuals to the strategic needs of the organization in any cycle in harmony with the disposition of the board as a team. And so do I think it only has to be members? I don't. I also think the definition of members is something that's under discussion at this moment, as traditionally the only definition of members was who pays dues. Ah. This is outside of governance now. We'll do this another time. (laughs) Right. But if I was to say to you, as you think about not who the organization needs just for today, but what are the representative points of view and strengths the organization needs to get where it needs to be in three years? What would those actually be? And if you just select for the present and not for the future, then you may not get there with what those are. The truth is the work of most boards of directors, if they are done well, there's a portion of it that's about making decisions of the moment, but the majority of it, the impact of it, is felt long after their term. The best thing that could potentially happen for a board is that those that are in board seats five years hence look back and say, thank God that board had that discussion or made that decision because things take time. But Lowell, how do you get this diversity and how do you get this forward thinking of a board when you call for nominations and you get the same people who are always active? Like, how do you get this deep diversity? You got any tips there? Well, if the start of your process is the call for nominations, then you're not going to get it in the right way. I mean, this is the difference. Mark Engel has a wonderful book about getting the right board. But this is the difference between having a nominating committee and a leadership development committee, right? Like what we want is a gamut of those who are assigned not just to select the leaders needed on a slate, but to year round be seeking new potential leaders that should be brought into the fold and considered. And that doesn't just mean like coming up with a spreadsheet with names, because if you put give a spreadsheet with names in front of someone who's selecting leaders, they're just going to go to the names that they know, right? There has to be some context to the people. There has to be some feeling with who they are. That's a whole volunteer effort or staff effort unto itself, right, is to build a Facebook, if you will, of potential leaders and where they would be best fit for what possibilities. I think that if what you want to see is a governance body, not just a board, but a full scope of governance body that continues to reuse and renew those that are dedicated leaders, but also creates opportunity and space for those who have not had leadership opportunity yet, so it's a a process of renewal, then that means you have to continue to feed the funnel, if you will, of who those potential leaders are and how they use them. And that, by the way, there's two aspects to that. That means that you need to rethink about what your cycles of committee work are. Right. And that also means you have to rethink about how you're offering opportunities that are outside of an annual or multi-year basis. 
So talk to me about committees. What are you talking about? I was just with an organization last week. You know, I asked, I was in a room with CEOs. I asked them, do you have a budget cycle? They're like, yeah, we do our budget every year. And I asked them, most of you have a strategy cycle? And most of them said, yeah, we do strategy about every three years. Hmm. I said, okay, so what's your cycle of reviewing your governance? And there was silence. And the difference between any element of your governance, if it's not on cycle, then what you're forced to do is to, when you need to do some sort of updated review, it feels subjective instead of objective. If you say we're going to review our entire governance cycle every two to three strategy cycles, then it's not about who's in the seats. It's just like you do an annual budget, a strategy framework every three years. It's part of our pattern. With committees, it's very similar. Committees, of course, are just one part, an essential part of the governance cycle. But I use a frame of what I call a phoenix cycle with committees, which if your organization is on a strategy cycle of strategy renewal or even confirmation every, let's say, three years, every time you renew your strategy, every committee should be sunset and reborn. Ah. Because no committee should exist without an operational strategic priority that drives its purpose and its existence. And so there's committees that will come back, but the top line part of the charge of any committee should be what is the strategic or operational driver that demands the need for this body. And then the charge comes off of that. And so every strategy cycle, you should have different things you're trying to achieve. It should change either what committees you have or what they're trying to accomplish. And even if you have the same people or some of the same people, their charge has changed and you're intentional about saying, this committee now is supporting this strategic plan. Wow, interesting. I was on a committee for an association and they charged us with, I remember, matching up the education of the organization with the different levels of people. So we came up with this whole plan, presented it to the organization, and then they said, oh, shucks, we've already determined the education for the year. And we said, oh, okay. So then next year, we did the same thing. We presented the plan, and the same thing happened. They said, oh, you're too late. And I thought, well, why are we doing this? Right. It seemed so pointless. So much work was going into it. They should have changed the cycles. Yes, Absolutely. The most precious commodity, it seems like any person has at this moment, in some ways more than money is time. Yes. I mean, I'm seeing more and more individuals willing to pay for things that will save them time than doing it themselves, even if they have the capacity to do so. And so if you're actually going to be successful in finding individuals or groups that are willing to volunteer, to give of themselves in their precious time, and you don't make that experience one that's meaningful enjoyable, recognized, and demonstrate the impact, the likelihood of them coming back is not high. And more so, the biggest point of success is you want them to recruit others right. to get involved as well. If it's a waste of time, I mean, Joanna, after you did that twice, how many of your colleagues did you say, you need to come serve on this committee, right? Zero. And I left. I said, I'm done. That's it. That's it right there. This is why work needs to be meaningful. And I'm working with one organization. They still have their traditional committees, but they're working on this multi-year project of reimagining the entire profession. And what they've created for each phase of the project are these sprint working groups that you are functioning for three to nine months with very specific tasks. And then at the end, they ask who wants to continue or who not, or who wants to come back in later. And there's a constant recruitment for new volunteers that can be phased in in the next phase. And you have people who aren't making a full annual commitment, but feel like they've had now hundreds of volunteers work on this in some piece or another. You have all of those feeling ownership over this industry-wide initiative. Wow. Rather than being like a committee that just led it. Right, right. And so there's a lot of potential there in terms of structuring governance that's meant to be inclusive and to create experiences that are meaningful. Hey, so I feel like so many of my clients are updating their governance right now. And is that a function of the pandemic and us climbing out of it? Or is that just a part of the normal cycle? It feels like there's more governance updates and more strategic planning happening right now. 
So I would say that my observation is this is a moment where organizations coming out of a time of crisis and trying to reestablish things they can depend on and baselines are trying to take a look at those structures by which those baselines are built on to say, are these foundational enough they can serve us still and serve us well? And so there are more organizations taking a look at those leadership structures. I think you could account for another other factors as well, right? Generation shifts, those that were thinking about retiring, many of them are, and there's cascading implications of that when it comes to leadership and to what governance looks like. The traditional models of you have to wait your turn if you really want to get the next generation involved, how long are they actually going to wait their turn? Right. There's many factors to go into that. And so I do think that the pandemic and in general, a more volatile society has been a catalyst for an exploration of what are the leadership structures that we need to succeed in the future. But my argument would be what I go back to before, Joanna, which is if an organization does not have an objective cycle by which it's doing this, anytime you're doing it, it's going to be subjective. Uh. And to get the right people that the CEO can have the right leadership at the right moment to say, should we look at the governance structure? Because governance review is an act of humility. Right. Your leadership is saying, what got me to this seat may actually not be the process we need. And I may not be needed on this seat. I may no longer be the right person in this seat. Exactly. For someone who has been in an industry, an organization for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and all of a sudden, what they've built up towards may no longer be what the organization needs, that is a very hard pill to swallow. And that's why you need to schedule it so that no matter what happens, you're having that regular review every three years, every five years, every seven years, whatever it is, no matter who's in those seats. Right. And look, hopefully annually you're doing some measurement and small adjustments, right? As you think about every strategy cycle, maybe that's where the phoenix of the committees happens. But a holistic review of all of governance, what I will say is that every time I do a governance review for an organization, and it has been 20, 40, I did one that was 70 or 80 years since the last time they looked at it, Oh, that review took two and a half years. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Because there were so many pieces that had to be looked at fresh. Wow. Hey, Lowell, before we go, I want to talk about an event that you put on every year, and it's called Charette. Yes. I've spoken to many people who say such great things about it, so tell me about Charette, and make sure I get an invitation this year, will you? You get the invitation. It's uh, <laughs> That is not a problem. And we try to make it inclusive. It's not meant for a single segment. We have, every year, executives and professionals and partners, consultants, it's small each year. We try to keep it not more than 30 for each iteration. But the point of it is that it's a co-creation experience where the content is actually determined by those that come to the experience. They submit the topics that they think are the most important for us to explore. The premise of the retreat itself is not to try to solve those problems, but through a differentiated inquiry process to just see, can we understand those larger societal or industry challenges better and walk away with better questions and better understanding that then can lead, if you will, to better solutions afterwards. Wait, so hang on. I'm attending a conference and I have no idea what we're doing and what we're talking about. You'll have no idea what the topics are because <laughs> that's what we determined together. But you will have the opportunity to contribute what you think a topic should be and share that and why it's an important topic to a cohort of peers that are there, not from places of ego, but from places of really wanting to explore possibility and priority that is going to impact the association profession. I run it at cost because it's, I think it's important for us as a profession to ask better questions. And as a facilitation process, I'm able to incorporate that sort of learning and leading through inquiry, both into some board training, but also into some larger reimagining what a profession looks like, multi-phase projects as well. So Lowell, is that why you call it a charrette? And maybe you can define charrette for my listeners. Charrette is an architectural term. It comes from the French word for cart. And what would happen is that when there was a huge problem that couldn't be solved, all the architects would throw their ideas and designs into a cart and go into a room. And it didn't matter if you were the most senior, revered, experienced architect or the new person. It was a place of equity of ideas that were considered until the solution was found together. 
And so the idea of a charrette for us isn't about finding the solution, but the idea is that everyone that comes together comes from an equitable place to start with, that we're looking for a diversity of perspectives, that contributions are without attribution to who you work for, and that when we emerge together, we all have a deeper, better understanding of how to potentially address the issues, challenges, and opportunities that will shape the industry that we're all involved in. That may not be specifically a solution, but in terms of the feeling of a charrette, it's a place of equal contribution from what topic we address to what questions we ask. Well, Lowell, I can't wait. And let's put a link in the show notes to information about the next charrette, as well as information about your website. Absolutely. We have a location in mind. I expect to uh, announce the next one in September, which will be for early 2024. I can't wait. Hey, Lowell, I am so grateful to you for sharing your perspectives on governance and for sharing some tips for how to make your organization stronger, healthier, and run better. So I hope you'll come back in the future, especially after you finish the PhD. Is that a deal? Afterwards, I'll have probably sleep a little more and be even more awake for another conversation. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye! Bye!